I'm Matt Corbin from Mission Aubreyville in the Louisiana Wilds. My wife, Lauren, who's going to lean over and say hi, is running technical things. Uh, we're so glad y'all are here with us. We're going to get right into this. We're just going to uh, introduce the topic and then take a look at uh, Dr. Hill's impressive CV, and then we'll turn it over to Jeff Hill to give his presentation. This is a nice opportunity to um, to uh, address some people I know are very enthusiastic about bird conservation uh, in general and ivory bill woodpeckers in particular. And what I'm going to present tonight is a, a little presentation I developed over the last few years for the conservation biology students at Auburn, because I realized that um, a lot of people interested in conservation didn't really understand how we got to where we are today in really in North American conservation of birds and mammals. It's probably a different story for a lot of plants uh, and some other organisms, but for birds and mammals, uh, it's a pretty consistent story. And so in, I, in order to uh, kind of uh, have people understand where I come from, you kind of have to understand how my thinking about this developed. So, um, I had a really nice childhood. I grew up in the suburbs of Cincinnati, uh, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the metro area, so not in the wilderness at all, but there were still extensive woodlands around. And I spent, I was always an outdoor kid. And so with my friends, uh, we fished in the tributaries of the, of the Ohio River and we roamed the, the forests around there. And we did that with absolutely no real worries about dangers in, in the forest. And, and what I didn't realize uh, until a lot later, until actually pretty recently, was that um, I was living in sort of in the Shire, uh, like in the, the, uh, the Hobbit area in Lord of the Rings, where it was totally benign. There was nothing that could hurt you. There were no dangers. And I'm talking about wildlife dangers, not people dangers. And the reason for this is, and I didn't really quite get this, I sort of understood as a kid, but that about 80 years before I was a little kid running through these forests in Kentucky, the forest had been uh, cleaned out of all predators, black bears, gray wolves, elk, American bison, uh, cougars, and venomous snakes. We were crazy herpers as a kid. We picked up everything we saw. And I'd be dead if there were venomous snakes in that area. The, the water moccasins and copperheads and rattlesnakes had been completely extirpated uh, years before I got there. Um, and I was living in a really a devastated world, a world that had been subjected to a a wildlife carnage that has had few parallels in uh, human history on earth, at least up until recent. Now we're coming up into an era where it's becoming more common. But at this era, there, this, this part of the world was about as devoid of wildlife as any place uh, on the planet. And, and the story that I was told and that I bought into is that, uh, you know, it was a choice between people and and wildlife and in order for people to live where we were living we had to change the habitat and clear out the wildlife and that's the way that's the only way people could live there it was a uh, habitat loss and uh just basically people populating the land that caused the loss of all those animals that were no longer there i mean it was a complete devastation i didn't see a white-tailed deer till i was uh uh, almost 20 years old, and and I spent every day of my life out roaming through the woods. There were no deer. There were no anything. I didn't see a fox. I didn't see a, uh, I certainly didn't see an otter or a beaver. They were long gone. I didn't see, and certainly just forget bears and mountain lions and wolves. That's ridiculous. Uh, there was nothing left, and, uh, and the story I heard is that it was, it was habitat loss, and then, uh, uh, pretty late in my life, uh, I visited India. This is when I was in my 40s. And India was a real epiphany for me. 
Uh, I'd done some world travel and stuff, but I'd never been in a place like India. India was unbelievably, overwhelmingly crowded. I'd never been in a place with so many people. You know, I traveled even in China and I traveled in um, uh, all through Europe and South America. Nothing was like India. India was just packed solid with people, you know, and, and it wasn't a new thing. It's not like, oh, in the recent decades, Indian populations swelled. India was crowded in 300 BC when Alexander the Great came into India. India has been crowded for centuries. Um, people everywhere, crowded markets, noise. Uh, there's just nowhere to get away from people essentially in India. And yet in this incredibly crowded part of the world, there was wildlife everywhere. We, we would leave the city, sort of, there were still people everywhere. And there were elephants right on the edge of town. There, all the wildlife was still there. There were gower in what would be little uh, city or county parks in the U.S. They couldn't even sustain white-tailed deer, these big wild cattle. There were uh, tigers uh, not far out of Bangalore, which is essentially New York city size city. Sadly, tigers have really gone down recently due to an uh, incredible price on their head in the international wildlife trade. But through the centuries, tigers lived in crowded India, and they even ate people. And yet Indians didn't go kill them all. They just, you know, once in a while they'd have to kill a tiger. But that was just live and let live. Tigers ate people. Oh, well, that's, that's just what tigers did sometimes. Um, we spent a lot of our time in tea plantation areas in the southern Ghats in the mountains in southern India. It's hardly pristine habitat. It's heavily agricultural. And yet... Wildlife was everywhere here. We saw wild dogs. We saw uh, uh, elephants and gower. Uh, we actually had a leopard running down the road in front of the car, right in a tea plantation, not in the forest. Um, wildlife and people and agriculture all coexist in India. Um, and so what I came to realize is that habitat loss played little or no role in the disappearance of most North American birds uh, in mammals. Uh, most North American birds and mammals that disappeared, disappeared in the 18th or 19th and early 20th century, and North America wasn't crowded in the uh, late 19th and early century. Certainly there was habitat alteration, there was a lot of cutting, a lot of taking of resources, but there was a place for animals. Way more than in India, in North America, there was always a place for, uh, for megafauna. Um, and so if I make the claim that habitat loss wasn't the answer, what could have possibly led to the loss of so many large, uh, birds and mammals in, in, in North America? And I think the answer is simple. Uh, it was bullets, bullets and nets and, but mostly bullets. Uh, uh, it was a, it was a wildlife carnage with few parallels in, um, in history. There's been some incidents lately in Africa and stuff which are just sickening that are, remnants, are reminiscent of what happened in the turn of the 20th century in, um, in, in North America. And, and it was real carnage. It was a, a devastation of wildlife that, that's just hard to comprehend now in our modern era. And of course, I think we all get that the huge herds of American bison were uh, eliminated with bullets uh, to, the, to, to the degree of millions of animals were killed, where you could pile up literally mountains of uh, American bison skulls. It's hard to spin a tale of loss of habitat creating the demise of bison when you've literally got a mountain uh, of skulls and, and, a, and a recorded history. Uh, uh, this was this was not pre-civilization. There were reporters and there were uh, there were writers that and photographers that uh, recorded this. This was a recorded event in fairly recent history. Uh, and the the carnage was everywhere for large animals, and it was the the impact of uh, high-powered repeating rifles is hard to overstate. 
So there was a man named Ben Lilly who was arguably the greatest uh, hunter, I guess you would call him, of large predators in the history of North America. Uh, he hunted, uh, he was a specialist on uh, cougars and bears, black bears and grizzly bears, uh, and mountain lions. He hunted with a pack of very good, well-trained and very efficient dogs, and he used high-powered rifles, and he killed an incredible number of mountain lions and bears single-handedly. He personally exterminated uh, both black bears and cougars from the state of, of Arkansas. He hunted them to the last animal purposefully. Uh, he wanted them out. He believed he was on a mission from God to exterminate all the malefic uh, maleficent creatures, which were the, the mega predators in, in North America. Killed thousands of, of bears and cougars. Um, he, he was a pretty famous guy. Teddy Roosevelt actually had some admiration for him because he was so tough and lived outside. So I think one of the greatest myths in American conservation biology is that habitat loss was the cause of the megafauna decline and extinction. Um, this is perpetuated um, all the time, uh, right up to present. So if we go, and I want to pick on the lab of ornithology, I have huge respect for the lab of ornithology at Cornell, but I'll pick on them for a minute. If you go to their website and you read about ivory bill woodpeckers, you read habitat destruction forced ivory bills into smaller and more fragmented pieces of forest land. This loss of habitat certainly pushed this magnificent bird of the forest towards extinction. I have to say, I think that's nonsense. Um, I don't think habitat loss played much of a role at all in it locally. Sure, if you cut down all the forest in uh, the Singer Track, it's not good for ivory bills, but that was one patch of forest in an entire continent with vast tracts of, uh, of forest. And we know that there was habitat destruction. Uh, ivory bills, of course, I don't have to tell you guys about ivory bills. Almost everybody listening to this could give their own talk on ivory bills and their habitat, whatever. Uh, it's a bird of southern wetlands, southern bottomlands, um, and um, endemic to the US. You could say, what about Cuba? There's good evidence that Cuban ivory bills are different species than the ivory bill woodpecker uh, in the US. Um, the uh, Cuban ivory bill, the imperial woodpecker, and the uh, North American ivory bill are about equally distant. If we're gonna lump Cuban ivory bills with North American ivory bills, we pretty much got a lump imperial woodpecker in there too. So I think it's an endemic uh, bird of the Southeastern US and it, it, they, its habitat was impacted heavily uh, when the cypress, uh, was harvested um, at the turn of the 20th century. But there was never a time when there was an extensive ivory bill woodpecker habitat. There was extensive ivory bill woodpecker habitat in 1860, in 1880, in 1900, in 1920, 1940, 1960. Through every one of those eras, there was a vast area for ivory bill woodpeckers to exist in. The ivory bill woodpecker would not have gone extinct if people cut trees and paid no attention to them. But people didn't pay no attention to them. People got fixated on ivory bill woodpeckers. Um, habitat loss is, is a very small part of the story of the decline of ivory bill woodpeckers. If we were in a live audience, I would ask people uh, if they know what is in this picture. Um, there was just a really nice article in, um, uh, it was in maybe it was in a magazine, um, uh, on, on ivory bill woodpeckers, and it had this picture, and the caption was uh, two two collectors with an ivory bill woodpecker, and it missed the point. These collectors are the guy over here is William Brewster. You know, at my introduction, I, I uh, uh, Mark said I won the Brewster Award. It's named after this guy. This is one of the founders of North American ornithology, and this guy is Frank Chapman. Frank Chapman was director of the American Museum of Natural History. Frank Chapman, is, he single-handedly started the, the Christmas bird count and was one of the leaders in North American conservation biology. These guys were on an expedition in 1890 down the Suwannee River. They saw exactly one ivory bill. It was the last ivory bill either of these guys ever saw in their life. And of course they shot it. Uh, and so that's, 
That's an ivory woodpecker. Last ivory woodpecker, as far as I know, there's ever seen on the Suwannee River. Shot and collected. Now that bird is in the American Museum. You can go look at that skin in the, in the American Museum. And by 1890, ivory bill woodpeckers were extremely rare. And yet, most of the ivory bill woodpeckers in museums were collected in the 1880s and 1890s because collectors were going after those last birds. There was incredible hunting pressure uh, uh, on ivory bill woodpeckers. In the, the, the museums of the world, and I'm not exaggerating by saying museums of the world, you can go in almost every museum in Europe, pull out a tray and see an ivory bill woodpecker. And you can certainly do that in virtually every museum in North America. There's over a thousand uh, specimens of ivory bill woodpeckers in world oh. museums, almost all collected in just a couple decade period when they were already near extinction. And most of the specimens of ivory bill woodpeckers were lost because most of the specimens were held in private collections that weren't uh, carried forward, weren't donated to museums, were just thrown away uh, when uh, estates were inherited or what have you. It was an incredible uh, uh, pressure on ivory bill woodpeckers by uh, collectors who were really good at finding these birds and shooting them. Um, so my, one of my key messages here is ivory bill woodpeckers were hunted and shot until they were merely, uh, nearly extinct. Even as their habitat sat there, perfectly suitable for ivory bill woodpeckers, vast forested tracks, the uh, vast forests in Louisiana and Texas, just work your way along the coast, the Mobile Tensaw Delta in Alabama, the uh, Conecuh uh, River System, Escambia River System in, in Florida, the Yellow, the uh, Choctahatchee, the Apalachicola, the Suwannee River, all of those river systems. Sure, they had had some trees cut out of them, but they sat there as intact forests through this whole time, even as ivory bills disappeared. Ivory bill disappeared because people were shooting them. They were, and, and these people were, these collectors were really good at finding ivory bills and, and killing them. It was their livelihood. It was the only way they were going to make money, support their families, and eat, and they were good at it. And it wasn't just ivory bills. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by ivory bills. I know it's the whole purpose for us being together tonight, but it was a wildlife carnage that um, was deep and extensive, and it almost left no large uh, bird or mammal and even, even fish and, um, and uh, uh, herps uh, unscathed. So, you know, you, I live in the southeast. I love going to natural areas. I don't see a lot of gray wolves or red wolves when I'm out birding. Uh, black bears were exterminated. Eastern elk uh, shot to extinction. There are no eastern elk. They're putting western elk in the east now because there's no eastern elk to, to uh, populate. White-tailed deer were shot out. A lot of people don't even understand this. White-tailed deer were reintroduced to Alabama. There were none left, and they had to be brought back in. American bison, of course, is gone. American bison used to graze in the... Uh, Black Belt region near Montgomery, Alabama. They've been gone for um, 150 years. Mountain lion, uh, they may have been like ivory bills. They probably ha hung on in tiny populations that were really good at staying away from people. They're kind of repopulating themselves. Beaver were ex extirpated. They had to be re reintroduced. River otter extirpated. Wild turkey had to be reintroduced to Alabama. Completely gone. Wood duck could have very easily gone extinct. Only last sort of ditch efforts to save that bird, saved it. Such a common bird now, it's hard to believe we could have lost wood duck. Snowy egret shot to near extinction in the Southeast, on and on and on. It was an era of wildlife carnage. Um, and ivory bill woodpecker was only one of the many, many birds and mammals that were persecuted. This was not habitat loss. This was direct persecution. I want to make this point most clearly with the passenger pigeon. If anybody ever argues that no, it was really habitat loss. Just t tell them about the passenger pigeon. And, and remarkably, even the passenger pigeon gets, gets lip service as if we don't know why this bird went extinct. To me, this is just, this is maddening. This drives me crazy. So I just went to look for a, a, a ridiculous uh, quote when I was making this talk. And I, I'm going to pick on this guy. I don't know him, Eric Gurney of Trent University. So just... In 2020, last year, 
he had a whole thing on the uh, trying to deduce how the passenger pigeon went extinct. For, for decades, two theories have been used to explain the extinction of the passenger pigeon. While it has long been understood that human activity caused the extinction, the exact mechanism wasn't known. Oh, a mystery we have to solve. Forget about reading it in the newspapers why it happened. We're going we're gonna to use some sort of sleuthing idea. The passenger pigeon is the poster child for that excessive uh, devastation of wildlife around the turn of the 20th century. So if we look at the population of, of passenger pigeons, and I've got their numbers plotted over here in the billions. So there were going into through the, the 19th century, there were uh, at least four and a half billion passenger pigeons. That's probably a really modest uh, underestimate, but let's just call it four and a half billion. And we go from four and a half billion to zero in an unbelievably short period of time. You have to plot it out to really get a feel for how, how precipitous and devastating the loss of passenger pigeons was. And so we went from, in 1866, a single flock of passenger pigeons was estimated at over 4 billion birds, 1866. By 1889, 23 years later, there were less than 1,000 birds left. So in 23 years, we lost 99.99999% of our passenger pigeon population. And our, amazingly to me, when we had the, the anniversary of Martha, the death of the last passenger pigeon, and this got some press, people were like going on radio shows and talking in serious tones about, oh, why this might have happened. And people literally, I, I couldn't believe they would do this because it's so ridiculous. They said habitat loss. Oh, you know, there was a lot of cutting of trees, could have been habitat loss. And people said diseases. Oh, maybe a mysterious disease took them out. Or natural cycles these birds tended to go up and down with the mass crops we know what happened to these birds it was corporate greed and it was, it's documented it's documented in the uh, formation of the companies in the llc uh paperwork it's documented in newspapers it's documented quite thoroughly in the literature uh, uh from the time and what happened was this wildlife resource suddenly became uh, uh, became uh, uh, marketable, that people were able to turn this wildlife resource into cash, and they did it. And, and they did it as a very organized legal uh, uh, deal. So the, we had the rapidly urbanizing uh, cities in the east with a huge demand for food. Railroads had penetrated the Great Lakes region. We had suddenly rapid communication with telegraph and an enormous cheap labor force. Suddenly, people ran the numbers and calculated, and they decided passenger pigeons were a harvestable resource. I call it the Walmart chicken of the 19th century. And, and so if we plot out, our, if we go back to our plot, and we say, well, what, what could have happened at that inflection point when we go from 4 billion passenger pigeons to zero? What happened was large-scale corporate harvest started. This is where uh, big companies started killing passenger pigeons by the millions and tens of millions. It's not a mystery why passenger pigeons went extinct. It's, it's recorded history what happened. Um, passenger pigeon harvest proceeded on an unimaginable scale. Um, these, this wasn't like subsistence hunting or uh, the, the pioneers killing a few passenger pigeons. This was corporate ventures that were huge. These, um, Corporations hired tens of thousands of men uh, with division of labor. They had scouts, uh, teams, and then they had shooters, trappers, cleaners, packers. This was such a big enterprise. We still, we still have uh, a part of the lexicon of this endeavor. We talk about uh, stool pigeons. We talk about uh, um, uh, uh, oh, the the um, anyway we. We have, uh, this was a, a, a brief but, but major enterprise in, in the history of North American conservation biology, and it was very effective. 
uh, in a very short time, this um, endeavor really wiped out the, the passenger pigeons. Once you had that uh, giant enterprise set up, there was no stopping it. And as passenger pigeons were rapidly declining, it was clear that this was not a sustainable harvest. A, a little bit of a, of a concern was raised and some debates occurred in Congress about whether the, the uh, harvesting the passenger pigeon should stop. And of course, it wasn't stopped because of arguments like, oh, that legislation would be a job killer. We can't stop now. We'll lose too many jobs if we, if we don't continue the harvest. And so passenger pigeons were harvested until essentially there were none left. And, and so this is really the legacy of Martha. It's, 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 it's really why we're talking about ivory bill woodpeckers is a nearly extinct bird, a bird that's so rare, it's, it's very hard to find and, and, and document. The ivory bill woodpecker declined along with the passenger pigeons, which actually went extinct, Eskimo curlew, which was hunted to extinction, uh, heath hen, that wasn't commercially harvested to extinction, but with no game laws and so many people in the Northeast, uh, heath hen was hunted to extinction. Red wolves um, hunted in predator control to extinction. Uh, Eastern elk hunted to extinction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This was not habitat loss. And there's no doubt, this was all recorded history. All of these animals were uh, disappeared, became very rare or went extinct um, because of direct persecution. And so this has real implications for ivory bill woodpecker conservation. When, if we have a message that ivory bill woodpeckers went extinct due to loss of habitat, then it's easy to make the, the case that, well, yeah, if there's no habitat, those birds can't exist and they must be extinct. But if, if the ivory bill woodpecker didn't disappear because of loss of habitat, but rather it disappeared because down to the last uh, findable bird, the birds were tracked down and shot, then we would have an expectation that the remaining ivory bills would be extremely wary of people. Only the birds that were the quietest, uh, uh, shyest, lived in the most remote areas could possibly have escaped the carnage of the, the turn of the 20th century. And I think it's a combination of both inherited uh, uh, kind of non-risk taking personality, which we know can happen in birds. It's well documented now in songbirds that, that birds have uh, um, inherited personalities that can be transmitted across generations. So these are those shyest, quietest, wariest ivory bills. All the bold, noisy birds were shot. Um, and ivory bills also have extensive uh, parental care and cultural transmission. So they also, generation to generation, teach offspring a simple rule, get away from people, never let a person get near you. Uh, so they make little noise, stay far away from human activity, and that makes them extremely hard to detect, hard to film, hard to record with sound recording. Doesn't mean they're extinct, just means they're very hard animals to detect. Maybe the hardest bird on earth to detect um, and, and record because no other bird was shot from a decent population down to nearly zero so fast with the ability to, um, uh, to transmit that. So with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take questions either on the topic of this talk or anything about ivory bills. If I have an answer, um, I'll be happy to give it. Great, Jeff, that was fantastic. I just had a few <clears throat> questions off the top. How do you think, uh, <clears throat> for those of you, um, I think this is a fairly sophisticated audience, but I said basically there are two explanations for why the ivory bill declined so precipitously. One is what Dr. Hill just laid out, that it was hunting pressures. And the other one, which is frankly more common, I would say, is what I call the, the Tanner gospel. And that's Jim Tanner wrote the Bible for the ivory bill. It was his dissertation uh, for Cornell. He wrote it, and it was published as a monograph in 1942. It's the Ivory Bill Woodpecker, um, and it's some great direct observation. So, Dr. Hill, how do you think? Uh, and I've seen uh, Jim Tanner's original notes in Cornell, and, and he seems to dismiss the hunting. I, I have a few entries where he's told specifically by uh, 
<clears throat> Mason Spencer, who uh, started the Brouhaha in 1932, and, and that he had shot a lot of them. But Jim Tanner seems to dismiss this out of hand. Do you have any insight on that? Uh, not like uh, study notes of Tanner or whatever. I can tell you the, the, the thousand specimens in museum collections all collected within a, a relatively narrow period of a couple decades uh, would speak to a really heavy hunting pressure. I mean, you've got lots of accounts like the Chapman Brewster expedition where they were specifically going out to get ivory bills when they knew they were near extinction uh, and shot the only bird they saw and the last bird they either of them ever saw in their life. And they weren't, they were, they were more, I'd say they were both decent naturalists, but they were not nearly as good as the people that made their living uh, collecting ivory bill uh, pelts uh, for museums. Uh, they yeah. were real, I don't think any naturalist exists today that's as good as those ivory bill collectors were at the turn of the 20th century in terms of going deep into the swamp, living for days or weeks in the swamp, really, really knowing that bird, having a lifetime of personal experience with it, and finding most of them. They got most of the birds. Early in my research history, I noted, and I've said this before, and probably our audience note, notes this, that essentially the discipline of field ornithology was birthed by Arthur Allen at Cornell with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I think in 1913 or 14. Anyhow, the point of the story is that by the time there was a discipline for that, the birds were in decline. So, so little of what we think we know is what we really know. That's what's always confounding. So given that, I always look to try see if I could find writings by the collectors. And I completely agree with you. It's having searched and, and seen the birds and how worried they are. It's amazing the skill of those people in, in killing ivory bills. So the most prolific collector was A.T. Wayne from South Carolina. So I've scoured the uh, literature for what he wrote, and he wrote very helpfully in the AUK, which, for, if y'all don't know, it's the publication of the American Ornithologist Union. A.T. Wayne wrote that <clears throat> he didn't look for ivory bills in particular types of forests. He looked for them where there was uh, da damage to the forest so that the beetles could get in. He looked for uh, fire, flood, drought, or previous insect damage. So really illuminating. Um, I do have a question about the provenance of uh, specimens. So one of the things we're trying to crack down, I'm a big fan of A.E. McElhenney. You mentioned uh, uh, E.A. McElhenney um, at Avery Island. With, he was a Tabasco. He was the second president of Tabasco. Uh, but uh, Mr. McElhenney single-handedly saved the snowy egret from extinction. And one of the great mysteries is we, it's his, he collected a pair, a beautiful pair that um, uh, in April of 1895, those birds are at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but we really we can't find anything in accession book. Do you have any insight on tracking down the origins of specimens other than what the museum has itself? Uh, no, you're not going to do better than a museum, especially not okay. Cornell's museum. So, okay. yeah, I mean, um, museums are run by people, and people vary in their um, bookkeeping skills or what have you. Yeah, I've been at several museums in my lifetime. I can't say I'm particularly good at that. I'm not a detailed person. So if you came to the Auburn Museum, I wouldn't be shocked if you found some specimens that were poorly logged in and you couldn't connect it to all the data. Uh, now, really important specimens, I hope. We've got a few state, first state records. I would be careful with those. But in 1890, you know, the ivory bill woodpecker was a good bird, but birds were coming in from all over the world. You know, maybe it, it didn't hold the marquee value it does now and I could see some sloppy bookkeeping uh in in uh in that time and I couldn't really point the finger because I'm no great bookkeeper myself so I did want to link uh it's a trivia question for bird extinction what do Martha and Incas the last pa uh, Carolina parakeet have in common and that is they both died in the same cage in the Cincinnati Zoo, Martha, 1914, and Incas, the last Carolina parakeet, 1918. So if we do catch a, an ivory bill, we're not sent into the Cincinnati Zoo. And yeah. uh, in reviewing the specimens, I found a possible zoo specimen that there was a live bird, apparently, could have been near St. Louis. At any rate, it's, I, I want to open it up soon to, to people's questions. I did have 
a couple others that I wanted to ask you about. But actually, Jeff, can you see the chats? Can you oh, see the chat I, questions? I remember to look at chats. Let me see. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah. So do I start at the top or the bottom? Yeah, I, I, whatever you want to do. I think go through and answer the ones you want, and if I can always fill in. Okay, um, I'll start with the most recent and work backwards. I guess that's kind of – got to take my glasses off. Uh, uh, okay, here's a, a, a question from Brian uh, Zwiebel. Uh do you have the double tap recording handy that you played in your program in the 2008 Amish Bird Symposium? Oh, sorry, I should have gotten that organized for tonight. No, but I could send that to you if you're interested. Uh, yeah, we have a – and really, Dan Mennell did all those recordings. But, yeah, we have a lot of really nice double knocks and Kent calls that we recorded in the Choctahatchee. But, sorry, I – I didn't get all my old evidence out and get ready for this. I haven't had that out in years, so it would take me a while to find it. Jeff, if I may interrupt, uh, what do you consider a double knock in and of itself? How do you assess that as evidence? You know, I you just don't hear two uh, powerful uh, uh, resonating bangs in a forest that have about that separation that, that you know, that the – uh, uh, Campophilus woodpeckers uh, do so. Um, you know, Mark. Uh, sorry, um, okay. uh, Matt. There's. It seems that the the way I rebuild woodpeckers um, uh, do that is with a single thrust and a resonating second knock. And and um, Mike Collins, uh, you know, who does a lot of searching, is a MIT trained mathematician. He's modeled that that resonance and uh and it 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 all fits with a a single hard knock that has a rebound and and the birds then have a second follow through basically all based on that first uh neck muscle movement uh and that's why sometimes i think you get a single knock from ivory bills for whatever reason that second knock doesn't come through but they all are basically double knocks some with a second clear resonance and some not Anyway, Mike has some really interesting stuff on that. I think he's dead on. It's hard to argue with the MIT trained mathematician when he's modeling acoustics. Um, but anyway, that's so you just don't hear that. I mean, you can mistake stuff. If you get it carried away, you can hear like little woodpeckers tapping and hear two taps. But that's not what we're talking about. It's a yeah. double bang, it's a powerful. Uh, it really, I think pileators can make pretty strong sounds, especially if they're on a hollow tree. But really, I've, the, the times I've heard double knocks, both both in South America with uh, other campophilus woodpeckers and in southern forests with ivory bills, it's a very distinct sound. It just it it it's not easy to mistake something else for that sound. And I'll we'll post uh, Mike Collins to whom Dr. Hill referred. He's got a site called Fish Crow. Fish Crow, I think it's .com. It might be net, but we'll post that on our Facebook page. And and I concur completely with Dr. Hill's analysis of uh, Dr. Collins' work. It's really impressive. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, then get back to that. Do you? <clears throat> I'm very good at identifying birds. I'm not a trained biologist. Uh, I can't find an explanation for why. Well, we'll ask for an ivory bill. Why do you think an ivory bill sometimes double knocks and sometimes calls? What would be the difference? Uh, well, a lot of birds have several sounds that they make. So I think um, uh, uh, the knocking by most woodpeckers is a long distance communication for territory boundaries and what have you. Uh, so they're telling other, it's usually probably males, I guess, and they're telling other male woodpeckers this is my area, or they're just, I don't know, whatever woodpeckers need to know, they're finding out what other birds are around. Uh, whereas the vocalization, so I'm thinking of other woodpeckers too, red bellies and, and pileated. That's a shorter range thing. It's usually for a me closer range communication, often between mates. So woodpeckers, almost all woodpeckers tend to mate uh, long-term pair bonds, and they spend the whole year with their, their mates in the territory. And they communicate a lot. They want to know where each other are, what they're doing, are they okay? And um, that's what seems to be the, the, the vocalization. And the double knock seems to be more long-distance uh, 
communicating with the woodpeckers, not their mate. Great. Um, did you use any means of trying to attract ivory bills in your search? We, <clears throat> I've used double knocks, uh, and March and Lambertink made us a box, but I, it was tough to get through the, the swamp woods with it. So I just used two, uh, two by fours on a tree. And the first time I did it, I got a response. And then that's the only time I've gotten a response. But I've always been worried that who knows what that means to an ivory bill woodpecker. Maybe that means there's a 250 pound ivory bill on a tree and it will make another male flee. Do you, do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Um, uh, well, first of all, we, the first year of our, of our search, which is 2005. Um, oh, oh no, sorry. 2006, the end of 2005 and into 2006, we never uh, tried to, to play a broadcast or mimic a double knock. And because we had listening stations set up and we were in there spread out and we didn't want to ever mistake what somebody else was doing for a real ivory bill sound. So we had a pact that none of us would ever make an ivory bill sound. And, and, and so the next year when we had a bigger search crew, we got maybe more desperate, more serious, however you want to say it, to get a good uh, documentation. Then we started to do that. We got the double knockers from Cornell. These are these wooden things, yeah. which could work. You had to be good at it. Uh, some people tried to use those. Some people took two sticks, banged on a tree. We always, we had walkie-talkies by then. We communicated with each other. We always called out that we were going to do a, a – double knock in two minutes tried to tell everybody so we and i don't think we ever recorded each other's double knocks as a ivory bill double knock uh, did, you, did and, you have a protocol as to how many double knocks in each session and how yeah uh, I, what the duration a long with time the ago i had to remember yeah we actually yeah. had time like uh you uh different people were going to do double knocks like exactly at 10 o'clock or exactly at 11 o'clock so that again we would never mistake a fake ivory bill sound for real ivory bill sound. So we did it with really strict parameters. So just to be careful about uh, people, because we had quite a few people out searching by then. Um, and, and we had enough people coming into our area as possible. Other people could have made sounds that we would mistake for ivory bills. But the first year was pure because nobody else was in there. Nobody knew what we were doing. And we'd ever made an ivory bill sound uh, by agreement. Great. Did, do you have the ivory billed woodpecker on your life list? You know, I never put it on eBird. I should, I've been thinking <laughs> lately. I don't know how uh, Cornell would deal with that. I'm thinking of putting it on eBird. Yeah, I think you should. I think just to, just to get a, a stance. But I I, it's it on some my life list, but I didn't live, put it on eBird. Yeah, I don't think it comes up on eBird if you search for sightings, but I think they actually put a filter on all rare birds. Yeah. So they won't show you a lot of rare birds like, if you put uh, lesser prairie chicken, they won't show you where the lecks are. Gotcha. They try to, to stop people from coming into them. But uh, I don't think there's any ivory bill woodpecker, including, including uh, you know, Harrison and Gallagher's sighting. I don't believe that's on eBird, but I could be wrong. If anybody knows that it is, let me know. But I don't yeah. think there's any. So I should do that. If, I really, if I'm serious about my sighting and I claim it, I should put it on eBird, shouldn't I? I'm actually going to submit the Fielding Lewis photos to the Louisiana Bird Records Committee and, and see what happens. Uh, I, mean, I, I know it's going to happen, but I'd like to have that on uh, the I record. Wouldn't, I wouldn't presume. These guys will talk about it and they'll look yeah. at it. Um, well, if you could get back to the chat, uh, I have many more questions, but I want to monopolize. Thank you so much. Let's see. Um, okay, Judy Chucker. I've always heard that passenger pigeons were shot to death. Where in the U.S. or what cultures, et cetera, are they uh, questioning the cause of the decline of the passenger pigeon? Yeah, passenger pigeon, like I said in my, my talk, were, were, they, they were shot in a sense. They were market hunted to extinction. They were harvested by the millions and tens of millions, an enormous uh, calling of wildlife. They were basically, I say, Rich people turn pigeons into trust funds, which, by wow. the way, the, the family wealth still exists. The wealth from those passenger pigeons is still being uh, passed along in families uh, that set up those corporations. It was legal, though. It was just it was unfair extraction of a shared resource by a few people. Uh, but, yeah, they were shot to death. It was not habitat destruction. It was not a mysterious disease. 
It was not natural cycles. It was a corporate venture that, uh, just like whaling, hunted whales to near extinction. Uh, it was a corporate venture. Uh, uh, tell us about your sightings, okay? Um, the uh, the the real the sure I had one sighting that that I don't think I'd put on eBird because it it wasn't a it wasn't a hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure it was an ivory bill. Uh, we had um, we had found this place in the Choctahatchee River in Florida in May of 2005. Tyler Hicks, Brian Rolek, and I on a weekend kayaking uh, search. Uh, Brian saw an ivory bill on that weekend, but he's a very inexperienced birder, and he kind of reconstructed it from from what he saw. He didn't know it was an ivory bill at the time. And then uh, I heard a double knock that weekend, and and um, we saw a lot of suggestive stuff. The next day, Tyler Hicks got a clear view of Ivoryville in that same spot. I'd gone home, and those guys went back out. Uh, so, and Tyler's a really good birder. Uh, uh, I, and so we we started going back when we had a chance. I'm a full-time professor. I didn't have all my time in my my colleagues were my employees. They were supposed to be doing Eastern Bluebird color work. And so they, I had a, a lot of work for them to do. So we didn't have all that much time, but we went down. Uh, Brian had repeated sightings in that same era, um, really convincing sightings. And so at, around uh, holiday season 2005, 2006, Brian and, uh, and um, Tyler and I went down and camped in the swamp. A few other people joined us, just a very couple, few other people that were friends. And uh, one of the mornings when we were paddling out really early, I had a bird fly right over my head that I just couldn't think of what it was except ivory bill. It was kind of a, like a small loon. It was a, a, a ex an extended neck and long pointed bill and long tail. Flew really fast and direct, but it was a... It was early morning, at not good light. I didn't get any colors on it, no pattern, uh, no sound. So I, I didn't know what it could have been, except it was not a cormorant. It was not a loon back in that swamp. Um, anyway, I thought it was an ivory bill. So, but that, that was hardly convincing. But then um, uh, maybe three weeks later in January, during one of our weekends, I was off by myself uh, paddling through uh, that flooded forest right at where Bruce Creek meets the Choctahatchee River. Uh, uh, so not in the channel, but there was high water, so I was just out in the forest, the whole forest floods, and uh, trying to maneuver through the trees and hit a woodpecker go off a tree really close to me, uh, maybe 20 or 30 feet away. It was hard to estimate. It just suddenly was there in front of me flying away, and it was an ivory bill woodpecker. It had white trailing edge, uh, black, otherwise black bird. Couldn't see any red on the bird, but uh, I couldn't say its crest was black. I just never saw any red. And it just did powered flight straight away from me. And I had a camera sitting in my lap, but we, you know, we had those old fashioned cameras that ran on tapes. We had limited battery. So I had it turned off. I figured if I ever saw an ivory bill, I would turn it on and focus. There was no chance. I had paddle in my hand, I was paddling. And I just watched the bird. I didn't do anything but watch the bird fly. Flew out a uh, few hundred feet and hit the, the tree line out in the distance. And it just disappeared. And what, what it looked like, it just went into the trees. I, it kind of hit the trees and turned as it landed. And that's the last time I saw it. I just stared at those trees for a long time. Probably not as long as I should have because I'm not, not that patient. But maybe 30 or 40 minutes. I just sat and I never saw the bird again. But the really crazy thing is, as that bird was flying away from me, to my right, I had a clear double knock. So I'm watching one bird fly away, and off to my right, there's a double knock. And, and so I thought, my God, that second ivory bill is going to come up and, and fly to, with its mate. And so one thing I did do is, after I watched that bird disappear, I got up my camera, turned it on, and got ready. Probably when I looked down, that bird left the tree line or it just was able to leave without me seeing it. Um, and then nothing happened. Now, interestingly, um, we had our listening stations. These are remote sound recording stations that Dan Mennell ran back in the day. Dan Mennell's a 
professor at the University of Windsor. He's a real sound expert. And he did these um, uh, continuous recordings. Uh, he had a sound station within a few hundred feet of where I had that detection. And just at, during my Iverville sighting period, he picked up both Kent calls and double knocks right in that same spot. So we had my sight, my visual on an Iverville flying away. I heard a double knock and Dan recorded double knocks and Kent calls in that same spot within the same uh, time period. Jeff, I'm, I'm going to exercise the privilege in it because I don't think if we've heard you say it, but <clears throat> as probably most of our audience knows, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, I think it was September 29 or September 30, issued a proposal that the ivory bill be declared to, uh, be delisted from the Endangered Species Act uh, due to extinction and the comment period, public comment period is November 29. What's your opinion of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's proposal? Well, I obviously don't agree with it, um, and, but I understand um, they, they have bureaucratic procedures they have to follow. And, and, and you know, and, and they're not a very political organization, but politics kind of seeps into everything. And so there's pressures and stuff. To at least uh, to at least uh, do reviews and 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 you know move paperwork forward, and so I'm not so much bothered by the decision that there's not enough evidence to keep it on the extant list of species. I would have liked in that um, uh, summary document. I would have liked to have seen more consideration of all the evidence because right. they didn't really. I don't think they gave fair treatment to. What we published in journals, and I wrote in a book published by one of the top uh, academic publishers, Oxford University Press, um, and, and other evidence, too. There's Mike Collins has published his sightings in paper. So if they had considered all that evidence, deemed it uh, either too old or not rising to the level that they were requiring, then I would have said, I don't agree with the the um, decision, but at least they did due diligence. They considered all the evidence. But I so so my biggest gripe is I don't think they gave enough consideration to all the evidence. Jeff, did why do you think they didn't uh, propose that the Eskimo curlew be declared extinct? Surely there's less evidence of the Eskimo curlew than there I is. I didn't even the know they had skipped that and gotten Iberville. I don't know. It's. I don't see conspiracies. I don't see evil intent or anything. These are bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic uh, decisions in, in movement. And uh, so I don't even know the person that got tasked with this, but a Fish and Wildlife Service person gets tasked with this job. The, the director hands them this task. They have to do something. They have to come to a decision. They work with the information they got. Maybe they don't get all the information for whatever reason. And maybe they're under a type timetable to do this. So, you know, it, maybe a bad decision was made just because it's a bureaucratic process and you don't always hit the greatest decision. But I definitely don't see conspiracies or evil intent or whatever. And it's, it's potentially a reversible decision. So we, can, we have a petition period and whatever. We can comment and... Um, and you could change. You could potentially make an argument that would change a decision. Do you intend to? Uh, yeah, I'm going to participate in one way or another in this process. Right, because I, honestly, I you know I'm one of your biggest fans, and I was shocked that the five year, year review didn't even make reference to your book. I thought that was quite an oversight. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that bothers me. I mean, they could dismiss it, uh, you know, with. We, but they have to at least consider it. It, it yeah. does look bad. And I would say um, it's to the Fish and Wildlife Service advantage to really look like they considered all the evidence. Because otherwise, if you want to feed conspiracy theories and cover-ups and stuff, just ignore some evidence, you know. Right. And I, again, I do not believe cover-ups, conspiracies. I think it was just, uh, I'll call it mistakes, bureaucratic mistakes. By gotcha. someone probably that has, is overloaded with work and is not in the ivory bill culture. They don't know everything about ivory bills and they just miss some stuff in creating the report. But there's a comment period. They'll, their attention will be drawn to the missed documents and now they can go consider it and maybe reach the same conclusion, but at least with all evidence considered. 
Great. Thanks. And I'll, I, if you can get back to the chat, I, there's some great questions in there. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, you, why don't you call them up? Pick the best ones because I can't even see them without yeah. taking my glasses off. So. Yeah. So Lauren's moving up. Mm -hmm. I see mostly approbation preach from, I suspect that's Britton Corbin. Mm -hmm. Hey, Britton. Um, and Richard, Richard Price, please email us in Northeast Louisiana. It's matt at missionivoryville.org. Um, Judy Chucker, I think you've answered this. Is, is that the historic cause for extinction? Over what time period does it rise to first place? And that's the hunting. What is that? What's the, the question, question is, uh, if, presuming that hunting is the, was a historic cause for extinction over what period of time did that rise to first place or was that always first place? It was always so what yeah. you got to consider let's say that uh people just never pay attention to birds they don't they don't like them they just uh, nothing to them and all they've been interested in are the trees so they and, and maybe convert into agriculture the question is what how many ivory bills would there be right now if people hadn't paid attention to them so no no shooting whatsoever no no killing they just cut the trees I think there'd be thousands of ivory bills uh, through the South. I think there's enough habitat to support thousands of ivory bills. Yeah. And there always has been. There was never a time when there were no trees. So the Singer Track is kind of exceptional because it's in the Mississippi River bottoms in the Delta that has really rich soils and got converted to agriculture. But all through the South, uh, the Deep South and along the, uh, the Gulf Coast, the soils are terrible. There's almost no row crops. And none of that forest got converted to agriculture. It's always been a forest. It's it's a forest right now. So, and I, and like so many documents uh, state, ivory bills are a disturbing species. Logging uh, logging cypress, but leaving all the rest of the forest intact, very well could have benefited ivory bills. They they probably killed a lot of trees as they moved their equipment in and out, and then they totally left. They came in, cut, left the, the forest, and there's no reason to think those forests weren't suitable for ivory bills. The problem is they created roads and they created access to every forest as they went in and logged it. And the ivory bill collectors went in right behind them and shot all the ivory bills. Yeah. I did want to address one, one bone I have to pick with the, uh, with the proposal is in association with it, it'll say that there were extensive searches for the ivory bill. Well, I've done this full time for two years and I can tell you, I've never seen anybody in the woods where we've seen ivory bills, heard ivory bills, who wasn't somebody who was part of our search team. So what's, what's your comment on whether we've searched extensively for ivory bills? No, it's like, um, it's the tiniest little searches in, in small areas. And, uh, you know, when we were searching, we were terribly equipped for this. We were probably equipped in the worst way. In the turn of the 20th century, anybody looking for ivory bills had a shotgun in their hand. And shotgun is really good at documenting ivory bills. <laughs> if, if you're a skilled woodsman, I, like that ivory bill that flew up in front of me, if, if I had been Brewster or Chapman in 1890, I would have shot it. And it wouldn't have been that hard of a shot. It was right in front of me. Actually, but, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, getting a, capturing that bird with a video camera is way harder than shooting that bird with a shotgun. Way harder. Yeah, that's a good point. One of the, the downsides uh, of the extinction proposal is I've heard, because we deal a lot with hunters, and I've heard many say, oh, that means we can shoot them now. And of course, I point out, no, the Migratory Bird Act of 1917 would still preclude, would make it illegal to shoot ivory bills. But that's a concern I have. Whether really? It's you think? I don't think, I don't think they have any protection now. If they're extinct, they're extinct. It's like if you get declared legally dead, you can't be murdered. There's a, there's movie plots on this. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think well, that, that somebody can shoot an ivory bill, but it's, it's almost no concern to me. Okay, good. Because um, people have been shooting at them. They've never stopped. Right. You got you to gotta go down. You are in Louisiana. I'd go to Alabama and, and Florida Panhandle. People shoot at everything every day of their lives. So right. they're still shooting at ivory bills. Yeah. Um, Mike Smith asked, were Cuban ivory bills also shot out? Well, I think Cuban ivory bill is a good case could be made for habitat loss. Um, I actually don't know the history of shooting in Cuba. I don't know the availability of guns. I don't know if the shooting culture existed so much in Cuba. But remember, Cuba is is tiny compared to the 
to the range of the ivory bill woodpecker. And the human population, the density of humans on Cuba is way more than the density of humans in the southeastern U.S. So, um, yeah, habitat destruction very likely led to the uh, loss of Cuban ivory bills. Um, Mar Martin Lamertink did a survey of the entire island of Cuba, and he didn't think there was a single patch of forest left that could support ivory bill woodpeckers in about, he did that in about 2010. Um, so and you, nobody could ever say that about the southeastern U.S. Yeah, great. Um, Joe Cockrell asks, why were pileateds not targeted? They were. As a matter of fact, there, I, when I, I first really got into the, I was totally into the habitat loss thing like everybody else because I never really thought about it, never read about it. And I reviewed a book for the condor, which I remember the name of the book, that really uh, proposed the shooting hypothesis. And I started doing a little investigation. I found an account of uh, the, what was going on at the uh, just at the post-Civil War era in Henry County, Alabama. It was just a, guy, a, a writer in Henry County of all the counties in Alabama about what the world looked like to him. And he talked about how everybody had a shotgun. Everybody was hungry, looking for the next meal, and they were shooting everything. He said that he hardly ever saw woodpeckers of any species anymore. He didn't see red-headed woodpeckers. He didn't see red-bellied woodpeckers. They were all shot out. Pileaters were definitely shot out. Uh, um, you know, the there, gray squirrels were shot out of whole areas of Alabama. Gopher tortoises were harvested to near extinction. Uh, alligator snapping turtles were harvested to near extinction. Um, alligator gar were harvested to low populations. It was a, it was wildlife carnage like that. It's hard to even imagine that um, so many things were shot to such low levels. Wow, oh, just just amazing. Um, <clears throat> what about the correlation between the extinction of the passenger pigeon and the the effect on ivory bill habitat? Do, do you make much of that? So the argument is that so many of the woods had were damaged from passenger pigeon roosts. And just for those of you who don't know that one of the principal things that the ivory bill eats is beetle larvae. And so beetles need a way to get into the tree. So they need damaged forests. Yeah, I don't put any stock in that whatsoever. Um, I mean, I have not investigated this, but I'm pretty sure the winter range of passenger pigeon didn't 100% overlap the range of ivory bill woodpeckers. I don't think passenger pigeons were uh, were roosting in big numbers in central Florida and the Florida panhandle where the center of abundance of ivory bill woodpeckers was. Uh, I think passenger pigeons were mostly up off of the coastal plain uh, in the oak hickory forest, mostly. Um, like I said, I haven't done a detailed study of this, but yeah, I don't, I don't get, I don't believe that. I mean, we don't have to look for any, we don't have, it's not like we have a mystery and we have to go look for how this happened. We have a thousand dead ivory bills in collections all shot when ivory bills were nearing extinction. Uh, and, and written accounts of people that worked wetland by wetland through the Florida panhandle killing every ivory bill. They wouldn't leave a wetland until they were all gone and then they moved to the next one. It was a yeah. systematic extermination of ivory bills with guns. Yeah. I'm looking through. Uh, Dan 9093 writes, there is a paper on duck wing collisions from 2006. Has there been anything on that crazy idea since then? And I gather that means, Dan, that, that it was confusion with it. Was, it was, the sound was actually duck wing collisions. Yeah, supposedly uh, ducks can, um, in, in escape flight, they'll bang their, their wings together twice like a double knock. Yeah, I, I do think it's it doesn't hold much water. It doesn't sound like a double knock um, of, a, of a Campophilus woodpecker. And um, we had almost no ducks in the Choctahatchee. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a area of very low numbers of waterfowl. All we had were wood ducks to speak of, decent numbers of wood ducks in the winter. We, I never saw a puddle duck in any of our Ivoryville sites. I never saw a gadwall, never saw a widgeon, never saw a mallard. Um, it's just flooded forests that don't provide, and with no grain crops whatsoever to provide food for these birds. So 
we had lots of double knocks and we didn't have any duck. And nobody ever said a wood duck would do that. It was a gadwall that was supposedly the wing smackers and we didn't have gadwall. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just a stretch. Yeah. Judy, Judy Trucker says, and this is something I agree with that, that it's important to report the ivory bill when you see or hear it. And there's, there's such a bias against reporting ivory bills that, uh, if, uh, from uh, Chris Haney with the observation reporting bias. And I think that's absolutely true. I know professional ornithologists who won't report sightings because of the backlash in the ornithological community. Can you speak to that? Really? I, I don't know any professional ornithologists that would. I can't they disclose. At least, they'd at least call me, I'm pretty sure, and tell me what they had. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be calling the newspaper reporter if you think you got an ivory bill. I would vet it really carefully with people you trust. So uh, since back in the day, I got a, a, just a ton of, um, of emails and accounts of ivory bills and, you know, 99.9% .9 of them were pileated woodpeckers, if not a redheaded woodpecker or even not even a woodpecker. I mean, it was some really bad sightings. And I was always nice to people. We never made a big deal about it. It, it shared like bird enthusiasm with them and thanked them for their sightings. But uh, I've just, just since the recent re-interest in ivory bills, just in the last month, I bet I've gotten what, eight or 10 emails, Dr. Hill, I got the picture. How can I transmit the picture to you? Okay. Uh, and then you, it, everybody's technologically challenged. I certainly, and they can't get the picture to me and we spend days and then it finally comes in, you know, and it's a pillar to woodpecker at their bird feeder you know, <laughs> in a, in a suburb with hardly any trees. And it's like, no, that's not it. Uh, you know, and you, you're nice to people, but uh, over and over and over again, it, people misidentify usually pillow woodpecker for ivory bill woodpecker. So in a sense, you could start to understand why non bird people would say, yeah, it's all that. Every bit of it is that it's just big mistakes. Yeah. So there's like I call it like the fog of ivory bill searching. There's such a such uh, mass disinformation that it the true story is really hard to get out. All right. Since you're not into conspiracy theories, can you can you spin that? Not spin is the wrong word. Can you abstract that? Why do you think that there's so much disinformation? Is it just bad science or or it's not bad science? Reporting? It's bad bird watching. Yeah, I think one of the most uh, critical points you made in your your book was that it's folly to expect uh, bird watchers to discover the ivory bill. Can you explain that to the audience? To document them, right. yeah. Well, um, you know, most bird watchers do not go far off road. They don't bushwhack into swamps. They don't climb into kayaks and kayak down wild rivers in, in flooded conditions and what have you. I mean, I'm president of the Alabama Ornithological Society right now. Um, we've had a terrible two years with the pandemic. But, uh, you know, we have our meetings. And uh, just a year and a half ago, we'd have a meeting with 100 uh, bird enthusiasts, really good birders in the group. There probably are not five people in that room that are even capable of getting into an ivory gold woodpecker uh, habitat. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, so, I did go ahead. I'm sorry, Jim. No, and so of the five that are physically capable, none would have any interest in doing that. Just That's a great point. Yeah. I've, I'm a former Louisiana Orthological Society president, and the current president, John Dillon, had sent out a, a request that for us to go birding in places people don't go. So I had the brilliant idea of I'd take them into the deep ivory bill woods. And fortunately, <laughs> I decided not to. And I, and I gave lots of reports about this is not you know, ordinary bird of watching. And we bought, I think for me, the most valuable tool is actually a good hiking pole. It's a, a, a snake persuader and it really helps me going up. Tree. Anyhow, long story short, yes, it was a, it could have been a disaster. We, everybody survived though, but uh, they really are two different worlds. Uh, I rebuild searching and birding. Yeah. The only reason I ever ended up in the swamp is because I was a kayak fisherman. I started fishing from a kayak got fairly proficient with paddling the kayak, stay in decent shape. And if I hadn't had fishing kayaks and been out on rivers uh, fishing, um, uh, spotted bass fishing and stuff, 
I never would have gone. I would have had no idea how to get into that swamp. They're really right. inaccessible places. Um, right. And so, yeah, it was just because I like to go fishing that I ever got into ivory bill stuff. Did you ever have any false positives that you thought a bird was an ivory bill and then it turned out it wasn't? Uh, not proven false positives. Uh, right. Not that we got very far with. And then uh, we, we uh, had false positives on bark scaling where we oh. thought, oh, man, this really looks good. And then put a camera on it and it was affiliated. I, I hate to interrupt. That's such an important point for those of you playing at home. So the ivory bill was thought, is thought to scale differently. Actually, Dr. Hill, if you don't mind explaining that for our audience. Yeah, and I'm no physicist in, uh, or mechanical engineer, but uh, ivory bills have a somewhat compressed bill. So Pilly Woodpecker bill is, is, is pretty round in, in uh, cross-section. And they, they use it um, like, kind of like an ice pick when they're going into the tree. So they, they dig kind of deep straight in, uh, create these kind of cone-shaped holes in the trees, dig out uh, all sorts of larvae and stuff. Where ivory bill woodpeckers have a, more of a flattened bill, it's more like a chisel at the tip. And so they can uh, strike under bark with the flattened bill and chisel off bark in a different way than, than pileated. They, they can often overlap in the way they forage, but I think there's a good argument to be made that ivory bills are capable of a type of foraging that pileated are not. And so really tightly adhering thick bark, they can strike and knock that bark off in big chunks and then what will happen is uh, beetle larvae, and I, again, I'm not an entomologist. I wish I knew why beetles, beetle larvae that are feeding on the decaying trees will bring their, their, their holes right up to under the bark, I, I, probably for oxygen, so they can breathe while they're in their holes. Um, and so there's no hole outside the bark. You can't see where they are. But if you strike the bark, you got it, and you got a long tongue. You got easy access to the grub. So ivory bills often feed by knocking. They hear, presumably, they hear the beetle right. chewing, and a human can even hear these beetles chewing. You can hear them chewing on the wood. They land. They hear the beetle, locate the spot, strike the bark, and then stick their tongue down the beetle hole and get the larvae. That's um, right. Yeah, and so that that and pileated would not feed that way. They they couldn't. They couldn't knock that bark off in that fish, and they would feed. They wouldn't even choose that tree to feed on. They'd choose another tree, softer bark, different prey. They would use use the forest resources differently. I'm I'm impressed with your <clears throat> your means of your measurement of uh, bark adherence. Uh, oh, yeah. I would say my rule of thumb is, you, I just know the tree species. So if it's a hickory or a pecan, which is very tightly adhering, it's living and they're scaling on it, then I'm then I'm compelled, but I don't have the means of uh, measuring the uh, adherence. Can you explain that to our audience a bit? Yeah, I knew we had to quanti We had to put numbers on stuff. If we wanted to publish in journals, you couldn't just say it seemed tighter to me. <laughs> uh, so I just got a, uh, a, a fish scale, a, you know, a, a, a digital uh, scale that you use to weigh your fish, which I actually already had. I got it on my tackle box. And just put a little um, a little hook on it so it could go under a bark at the edge of a, a spot on a tree where a woodpecker had fed. And I just slid it under the bark and pulled till the bark came loose. And it told me how many pounds of pressure it took to, to pull the bark off. Wow. And uh, I went around to, to trees in the Auburn area where I'm pretty sure there's no ivory bills, but lots of pileated. Went to feeding trees. Uh, Chose, didn't choose feeding trees, did every feeding tree in a patch of forest, try to be objective and, and um, not biased in my choice. Compared the adhesion of bark on woodpecker feeding trees in the Auburn forest in Choctahatchee and the, um, the, the adherence on the, on the trees in the Choctahatchee averaged higher. It certainly had a higher tail of the distribution. There were a lot of woodpecker feeding trees with more tightly adhering bark than anything I saw up in Auburn. So anyway, I put some numbers on what we were seeing anyway, just walking around through the forest.
Uh, I think that's ingenious. Um, Richard Price asked if there were images of the scaling of which you speak. Oh, yeah. I put some in my book. The book's called Ivoryville Hunters. We used to have a bunch on my website. I got to get – my website was um, maintained by our college, College of Science and Mathematics. They went through kind of a dark era of website maintenance. Again, people think, oh, Hill took his site down. He's trying to hide stuff. <laughs> uh, the IT guys just – didn't maintain it it still exists we just gotta get the links uh recreated so i need to bring that back but yeah i've still got a bunch of pictures on my computer and uh in on that website and in the book i put some of the most interesting ones i have a few places where there's there's places where a woodpecker struck the uh a tree as they were feeding and they actually curled the bark just like a wood carver would do with a chisel and I made the claim I just didn't think it was physically possible for a pileated woodpecker to be able to do that, to, uh, to, to slide under wood and, and curl the wood around. But again, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but it seemed like a unique kind of evidence. Do you think, it, speaking of evidence, do you think it would be useful if we found similar scaling in areas where we know there aren't ivory bills? So I'm always looking, I'm trying to hook up with pileated researchers yeah. to determine that that you know uh we'd like to be able to come up with a pattern that only an ivory build can do that and one of the things specifically is i've seen places where we've seen ivory bills i've seen really chiseled looking lateral strikes that i've not seen for instance my, my wife and i lived in ohio for eight years uh we never saw anything like that and i i can't of course i can't say they're ivory bills but do you uh, so basically if there's extensive scaling and there's no gouging, right, then that's yeah. more compelling to me because as, as the audience might not know, pileated woodpeckers, because of the function of their bill, bore deeply into the sapwood usually. Yeah. Uh, I, so here's the problem. Uh, yeah. it, it's, kind of, it's, it's an interesting exercise. It's lo I think it's logically sound, but it's already been taken as far as it can go. There's just nothing more to get out of out of looking at trees that have been fed on by a woodpecker. Because the problem is we, we don't, to really do this, you'd, you'd want to watch an ivory bill feeding and walk right up to where it just was and say, okay, we know that's ivory bill. And then you'd watch a pileated feed and you'd walk right up and say, okay, I know that's pileated. And then you take your measurements. But instead we're creating these scenarios like, oh, they can only feed in this way or that way. And then we're going and kind of, uh, supporting our ideas by going into the forest and it's never going to convince people that are skeptical because it because it's uh it's it's all built on assumptions and presumptions i think it's interesting but you know it's not going to change any it's, it's not going to change any of the thinking of white people one of the questions brian uh saberwing has pointed out that there are about a dozen ivory bill reports on ebird <clears throat> None of them recent, though. I, I looked oh, at eBird. It has the, yeah, it has the What's the most site. recent? I should have looked at that. What's the most recent one? Probably Tanner from from 38. They, they probably who, accepted who Sonny Boy looking? the photo. Brian was just looking? Yeah. If he's still Brian? there, I'm, I'm curious to know what is the most recent one on there. Because there and should we, at least there should at least be the Luno video documentation because the Land of Ornithology was, they, they were, they, and to my idea, they're still in on it. Fitzpatrick still is sure that's an ivory bill. So that should be on the, the eBird site. Yeah, it's, it, that signing was accepted by the Arkansas Bird yeah. Records Committee. But as you pointed out in your book, there's not much to go. We didn't really get much uh, information as to why they accepted it. Um, <laughs> look for new messages. Hey, Jeff, I had a question for you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for presenting. Really enjoyed it. Um, so if somebody wants to get video or photo evidence of an ivory build, say like in Louisiana or something, what would what would happen next? Like, would anything change, or would it? Oh yeah, it would. It could change a lot. Well, first of all, you'd have to you'd have to overcome the immediate claims and skepticism that it was all fake. 
So, um, but if you have personal credibility, if you're an honest person and you've, you know, you've led an honest life, so you got everybody that you know knows you're honest, that goes a long way. You know, if, if you got a little history of, I don't know, not being honest, there's, it's kind of hopeless. But it's presumably, if it's a video, or like a GoPro um, recording, and I'm no video expert, there's probably ways where, where you, you have the original you could turn over the camera if you could get forensics experts or whatever to to do the work. There's probably ways for a forensic expert could uh, could make statements that there's almost no chance that this was tampered with. It wasn't doctored. It was it's in the original state, uh, what have you. Um, and then the thing you wouldn't want to do is as much as it'd be nice to profit off of it, like to immediately get a, a photo agent and start selling your picture. That would really make skeptics think this was all just a hoax to make money. So, I mean, if you spent a lot of time trying to get this picture, it would be nice to get some reward for it. But if your biggest concern is documenting ivory bills and uh, and uh, d demonstrating their existence, you'd want to just just release it. Release it. First of all, maybe get it, present it to ornithologists and get ornithologists to agree that that's definitely an image of an ivory bill woodpecker. So you get immediate statements from uh, knowledgeable people and, and then release it. No secrets, no, no, uh, you know, just make it so you're pretty immune to, um, to conspiracy stuff. Cause there have been fake ivory bill pictures and there have been, you know, I don't think it's that hard to, to sleuth them out. Uh, but anyway, that would be my advice. Uh, try to get some uh, some people with decent credentials to work with you, and then just get it out there. Would there be any fear about like specifically stating the exact location of it and having like you know you wouldn't want a ton of birders going in there or even hunters or anything like well, that's kind of what my main concern would be. Yeah, and that was we played that game. You know, we were we, we had ivory bills. We were all worried somebody's going to come into our site. We were all secretive. Nobody would tell anybody. We were going to do this ourselves. In retrospect, it was a terrible mistake. But the, what we should have done immediately, we should have called all the people that we really needed to hear and see these birds, like David Sibley. We should have called the uh, try to get anybody from Fish and Wildlife Service to come in with us. Uh, we should have gotten uh, every ornithologist I know to anybody that's willing to come down there and let because if 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 Sibley and Jerry Jackson and um, and, and you know um, all the uh, uh, John Dunn every uh, Ken Kaufman every famous birder in North America and all the ornithology professors that all had the shared experiences we had these birds repeatedly day after day double knocking Kenting. They'd all heard it. We'd be in a different world right now. That would have been thoroughly documented back then. We would have had, you know, 10 ornithologists and all the major bird book authors all saying there's no doubt I, that sound could not have been anything else. And who knows where we'd be right now. So no secrets. The idea that a bunch of birders are going to get in kayaks and go back in that swamp is a joke. Uh, and, and come out alive. Let me be very clear with working right. with birds. <laughs> dead ornitho a few dead bird watchers who got the kayak for their first time and didn't ever come back out of the swamp. Yeah, there are lots of gators and snakes out there. But also, ivory bills are so mobile. Um, you know, probably if there had been a nest, you probably have already disturbed it, Get getting your documentation. And besides, there's nothing more important than keeping people interested in ivory bills. Because as much as I say habitat destruction had nothing to do with the decline in the turn of the 20th century, now it's a thing. Now there's way more people in the southeast. Now we got suburban sprawl and the whole countryside being eaten up with development. It's a different world now. Uh, uh, saying that that didn't lead to their decline doesn't mean that it doesn't have any relevance in 21st century uh, conservation. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I would uh, really uh, say to anybody, don't make the mistakes we did. No secretism, 
no, uh, um, I don't know. Just lay it all out there. You can't go wrong by being absolutely upfront about everything. It could save ivory bills. I don't know. Yeah. For, for what it's worth, that's what we're going to start doing on November 1st. Our hope is to get people in a line to be just a, uh, you know, a line of people spaced out a half mile or a quarter mile on different axes for areas where we think the birds are. And just at, at dawn, because where the where we're on the bird now, uh, Palmetto is so extensive, you cannot move stealthily through the woods. Um, so always a problem. I, Derek, did you have any more questions? If not, I was going to. Um, well, I just wanted to mention, I think one good thing about the possible extinction declaration is it puts a lot of spotlight on the ivory build where, like, you know, people, I feel like it had kind of been in the back of a lot of people's minds, but now it's at the forefront. So maybe now's the time, you know, we can get some documentation or something. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, it's absolutely true. There's more interest in ivory builds in the last three weeks than there had been in the previous 10 years. So, yeah. Um, Maria asked, how big a population or populations of ivory bills would you estimate there could still be and at the highest? Does that make sense? So currently, do you have any estimate? And what do you think the highest population yeah. of ivory bills was? There's really nothing to go on except they keep getting detected here and there. So ivory bill woodpeckers uh, essentially disappeared from human knowledge, at least in the, in the Gulf Coastal Plain where I do all my work uh in the 1920s um and and so they suddenly reappeared if people believe that if with our search in the choctahatchee in that part of the world in um in 2005 and so they were gone for about 80 years or so so their only way a bird like that could have made it through 80 years of time is with the population of it wasn't two birds and it wasn't four birds. It had to be, you know, about 30 birds at a minimum making it through those 80 years. And that, think, that always, as you pointed out in your book, I think you called Tanner's uh, census leading to 22 ivory bills extant in the United States was one of the biggest follies in conservation history. Can you explain just for those of you who might not know, Jim Tanner, we referenced before, and, and I'm going to say this is going to sound disparaging, but he did great field work. And much of the direct observation that we know about the behavior of the bird comes from his 1942 monograph, The Ivory Billed Woodpecker. In there, he was commissioned by the Audubon Society to do a census of all the birds in the southeastern United States. And it's not a slur to say, but it's true that he never found any ivory bills. I'm not sure he ever found any ivory bills by himself. And he was led, the Cornell expedition was led to ivory bills initially in 1935 by one of my heroes, J.J. Kuhn. Point of the story is the only place that Jim Tanner saw ivory bills was in the Singer Tract in Northeast Louisiana. And then I think he allowed for other places in South Carolina and Florida uh, to add to his census of 20, 22 birds. And the, I think that's an albatross around our neck those of us who are ivory bill searchers, because you see so many, to me, frankly, silly mathematical models about when the ivory bill had to have gone extinct because there were only 22 left. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think it, it, it wasn't really possible to census ivory bills in a serious way at that time. Uh, for one thing, um, Tanner knew ivory bills from the singer track and, and those were, those could have been some of the last tame birds um that that for whatever reason hadn't been shot although we do know that they they, they even that population had been called had been shot um and so his perceptions of ivory bills and what he expected in terms of their noise level and and what have you could have just been wrong um the ivory bills that were left by the time he he went around to some of the areas and was looking for them were those last remaining ivory bills that were the only birds remaining after uh, ninety nine percent of the population was shot out, and so they would have been really wary. They would have been back in the deepest swamp areas, and there's just it's just an absolutely enormous uh, area to try to cover, and very remote. And imagine in whenever he was doing this nineteen late nineteen thirties, man. I mean, uh, Auburn University. It was a it was an all day drive from Auburn to Atlanta, in in that area there weren't paved roads and this was a developed part of this 
the state. I mean, there was it was very hard to get around at that time. He never, as far as I know, he never even considered the Yellow River, the Escambia River, the Choctahatchee. He went to the Apalachicola. Uh, but, you know, he just skipped huge areas. Um, and uh, just, it, it's not convincing that, that he, he documented all the ivory bills that were left in that vast area. There, there were very contemporary criticisms of that from people in Audubon uh, that they haven't gotten much play. And in particular, Herbert Stoddard, well, it, it looks from the record that uh, the principal professor, Arthur A. Allen at Cornell, it looks like he quizzed a few people whose uh, opinions he respected. And so Herbert Stoddard wrote to Jim Tanner in, uh, I think, late 36 or early 37, saying the distribution of that ivory bill is much greater than thought. And if I spent the rest of my life, he was in his 40s, searching for ivory bills throughout their possible habitat, I could only cover half of the habitat. And, right. uh, and I think he, he later wrote some things about that. So I do think that's an albatross for us. Um, so how many are left is a real, it's just pure speculation. And the, the thing is, we have almost no information. You know, we get the glimpses at very long time periods. So it's possible that we all came into this at the very twilight of ivory bills, that we're into the last remaining individuals and pairs Maybe these things live to be 20 years old or so, 25 years old for an old ivory bills. And we're just seeing these last old ivory bills that are the remnant of those last few dozen that started in the, in the 1920s and they're down to the last few birds and they're going to peter out. That's one possibility. I mean, we just don't know. Or alternatively, ivory bills may have been recovering since the 1920s. And, and the reason that suddenly a few started to be seen here and there around the turn of the 20th century is, 21st century is that there's actually a few more around than there used to be. Maybe we're up to a few dozen birds in that vast area and they're starting to be a little easier to find, a little more visible as their populations slowly come back. We don't, I don't know, it could be either one of those things. We don't know. A, a constant thing in, in the reports I get that are credible is that the bird was flying low and that was my first experience with an ivory bill. Was, I've never seen a bird fly that fast, that low through the woods. And of course, I think that's a function of the ivory bill has to bleed off kinetic energy to zoom up to make a landing on a tree as opposed to a pileated, which can throw out those big boat paddle wings. So I noted in your book that you said uh, you posited that you might be able, a, easy, even easy is the wrong word, that you might be able to net ivory bills because they do fly low. You want to comment on that? Uh, it's probably, I shouldn't have probably put that in there. It's just, <laughs> it, you know, I actually have done a lot of bird netting in my, in my career as an ornithologist. And, you know, it can be hard to catch a stupid Carolina wren sometimes. Um, uh, it, you know, you, a really low density bird in a big forest it would be an incredible luck to yeah. just randomly net one. The, the funny thing is um, I have an ornithology colleague, Jib Bednards, that uh, I went to grad school with for a while. And he, was, uh, he actually was working in, in near the Cache River, in the White River area mostly, for years before the, um, uh, before the dis rediscovery. And uh, he was working on Swainson's warblers and, and some other stuff. And he got a grant to study pileated woodpeckers when the the Cash River bird was photo was uh, videotaped, and uh, and so they were out with big nets catching pileated woodpeckers just to to get an idea of where those birds were going. And he told me once that they were all ready to if he, they had ever caught a ivory bill woodpecker, they were going to slap a radio transmitter on it and and let it go with no permission from Fish and Wildlife Service. They were just going to take whatever whatever flack they got from Fish and Wildlife Service, because then they would have been tracking an ivory bill through that forest. They would have gotten unprecedented information on, on the ivory bill woodpecker. Yeah. Uh, just, anyway, just, I, I, I'm sorry I stepped on you. What did you say at the end, Dr. Hill? They never caught one, so. <laughs> that they one. told anybody about. So, Sonny, so ivory bill trivia, the only – Ivory Bill was actually banded was in uh, 1938 in March. It was Sonny Boy who was a nestling who 
Jim Tanner climbed up into the tree to, to assess what was going on inside the cavity. And to his horror, this uh, young bird who couldn't fly yet came tumbling out of the uh, cavity and, and fortunately hit a few uh, bushes on the way down. That's you might've seen that's the famous photo with uh, on JJ Kuhn's cap. Uh, Brian and Brian, I'm sorry if I should know your name because I've seen you before. It's Brian Zweibel with saber wing nature. Uh, he got the eBird information for it. It says 1935 singer tract in Santee river swamp of South Carolina, none from Arkansas and 1949 is the most recent for Cuba on eBird. Thanks. Wow, I'm, I'm putting my ivory bill siding from Florida on there. <laughs> Good luck. I, I can't get a Backman's uh, Sparrow accepted in Louisiana. So <laughs> it's, it's a tough crowd. Um, of course, I haven't won the Brewster medal. Uh, I, I, that's the last time I'm going to throw that up there. Uh, we did have another. Oh, Mike Smith asked, are there any parallels with the extinction of the Carolina parakeet? Uh, not many. The Carolina parakeet's actually a bit of a mystery because they were not market hunted. And to my knowledge, they weren't trapped in huge numbers. They were certainly trapped. They were caught for caged birds a bit. And they were an agricultural nuisance, so they were shot occasionally. But, uh, and I haven't made a careful study of this. I don't believe that there is evidence that they were shot to extinction. Uh, a hypothesis that I've seen that actually makes a lot of sense to me is that Carolina parakeets um, were driven to extinction by the introduction of the European honeybee to North America. So Carolina, Car Carolina parakeets were, were uh, nested in colonies in big hollow trees. Um, and when European honeybees came into North America, they, 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 they had a huge almost over expansion and filled a lot of the hollow trees in, in native forests as they expanded, and they may have displaced uh, uh, Carolina parakeets. There's no direct evidence for that, but, you know, Carolina parakeets disappeared before there was really a lot of human pressure, all the way out in Missouri and stuff, while it was still mostly underpopulated. Um, and, you know, the only other... Uh, North American bird that was highly dependent on big hollow trees was the chimney swift. And chimney swift moved 100% in the east to chimneys. They're, they literally don't nest in hollow trees anymore. So anyway, it's, but I don't think there's much parallel between Carolina parakeet and Ivorville woodpeckers. Uh, Mike Smith also asked, have any mathematical models been done to demonstrate how the numbers of birds shot would impact on estimated population and their density vis-a-vis -vis breeding at the time? Um, no, not that I know of, but it's pretty easy math. If, if yeah. you keep subtract, if you have, if you start with like a thousand and you just keep subtract, well, you, you subtract in bigger numbers at first, dozens and hundreds, and then as the, the parent population shrinks, you keep pulling out you know, your tens and then finally singles, you know, you'll pull enough marbles out of that bag that you're not going to have any marbles left. So, yeah, I guess you can model it, but it's just a, uh, it's just a subtraction exercise, I think. Um, Richard Price asked, uh, he sees a lot of people hunting on bayous and creeks. He sees the advantage of being able to cover ground but what would they do? Do they frequent water bodies more often than the bottomland flats? Uh, both. So the, these, these forested areas, the Choctahatchee in particular, is really dynamic. So um, I imagine right now it's, it's pretty much a, the Choctahatchee is flowing in its banks and the Bruce Creek is flowing within its banks. And you could walk right through uh, most of the forest area just get a little mud on your feet, crunchy leaves and all that. But uh, just a couple weeks ago, we had a lot of rain. It was probably way out of its banks. You could have paddled a kayak through a lot of the forest. And But in the summer, it doesn't tend to flood as much because the evapotranspiration of the forest pulls so much moisture. And it's really, re you see it really conspicuously down there. You get to this time of year, the leaves come off the trees. 
then the first big winter rainstorm in, in uh, November or December completely floods that forest because there's no evapotranspiration. There's no draw from the vegetation. All the water sits in the basin, and uh, that river just fills the whole basin. So then there's almost no dry ground. It's almost all underwater. Ivory bills feed in there year round. So they're, they're feeding over the dry leaves in the low water and they're feeding over the water in the flood times. Um, and Richard, I, I wanted to chime in on that. It's one thing for the ivory bills to be there. It's another for them to be able to be seen. So when we're looking, we really look for just like a hundred wood lines of sight. So it may be that they're overreported from being over bodies of water because you can see them clearly as opposed to if they were in the woods, you couldn't see them. Um, I, I just want to alert since Dr. Hill has been great. I, let's, let's wrap this up in about 10 minutes. I don't want to keep you all night. And this has been fantastic. And we'll, we'll post more about it. And I just want to say thank you for everyone who's come. And we'll get to, it looks like there are a couple other questions. But next week, I, I hope to get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, someone, a representative to speak to us. And if not, we'll just present our plans as Mission Ivory Bill and just call it something along the lines of the Ivory Bill Woodpecker what now but we'll put up an event soon we we really appreciate y'all so let's say we have a new message oh, okay richard price says it. i understand um and i think i've gotten pretty much all the questions uh there was a question john williams was discussing about uh water dna um jeff did you look into that water edna i think it's the term uh, and no. so the theory is that you could sample water and now our our the ability to detect DNA is so sophisticated that if an ivory bill emitted some sort of organic uh, material, it would be in the water and you could determine that. You, you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know that's technology. They, they, it's used mostly for aquatic uh, life. I don't think, if you did a water sample, I don't think you'd pick up hardly any of the forest birds like you, you probably wouldn't even get chickadees and titmice and stuff there's just not enough dna uh coming off of a bird to get into the water to be detectable um it's just it's almost an impossible situation especially for a really rare bird the idea i had years ago was to do uh blood meals and mosquitoes because uh, i was actually on a project encephalitis virus project where my entomology colleagues were setting out mosquito traps and getting blooded mosquitoes and identifying the bird host from the blood meal. Wow. In a barcoding. Uh, but it turns out woodpeckers almost never turn up. They're really good about not letting mosquitoes get them. Um, I don't think we ever had a woodpecker of any species in a blood meal. And th these are taken from areas that have tons of downies and red bellies and pillow that, woodpeckers. That, that actually brings up a good point. If you suspected that scaling were for an ivory bill, were from an ivory bill, what are the chances of you getting collecting any DNA uh, material that would be useful from scaling? From a fecal example? sample, you could get it. Wow. Uh, yeah, from that would be pretty easy. Or if you ever found a cavity, a roost or a nesting cavity, an old nesting cavity, you get DNA from that for sure. Uh, so I had, um, back when we were doing this, I contacted some of my friends that – we're good at, um, uh, at DNA identification. Rob Fleischer at the National Zoo, Joel Craycraft at American Museum. Who else? There was a third one. Anyway, they all said, yeah, we got the primers. You get anything, send it to us, and we'll, we'll test it. So did, you, did, did you send anything for testing? We never had anything. We ne that first year, if, I had, if we had known there was a fresh cavity – right next to where we had a couple ivory bill sightings. We're pretty sure we scared an ivory bill away from either uh, the beginnings of a, a nest cavity where it was going to nest or it just dug a new roost cavity. And, um, yeah, it was, right, it, was, it was right next to where we ended up camping. Big, uh, big hole, fresh. It, was, it had just been drilled. Um, and uh, at that time, that's the kind of cavity – I would have felt okay getting stuff out of the bottom and sending it to my buddies to see if they could get DNA. But uh, that, by the time we had any idea to do that, it was a year old and we didn't go back in there. 
Ashley Patel asks a good question. Is it possible that the ivory bill has adapted to a new habitat or geographic location where we aren't looking for it? Oh, it's possible, but it's not very likely. Birds just don't do that, you know, uh, not to an extreme uh, deal. It's So where we found the bird and where Cornell documented it, where a lot of the people have been documenting ivory bills, it's dead on for their historic habitat. You know, it's in these big bottomland swamp areas. Um, and there's no better place to hide anyway. There's no place that would be harder to find a bird than those habitats. I don't know where it would go, where it would be less detectable. I'm, I'm going to push back a little in that uh, our audience might know. In 19, either 86 or 87, the experts were convened. It was Lester Short, who was the woodpecker expert of the 20th century, yeah. and uh, Jim Tanner and Jerome Jackson. Uh, they were convened to come to an opinion as to the ivory bill. Uh, and I think actually Jerome Jackson's the only one who's the opinion that the ivory bill should not be declared extinct. But anyhow, back to Lester Short, uh, he wrote of the ivory bill that it was his theory that the ivory bill was a pine specialist at the time of European contact. And then the southeastern pine forests were largely burned and that the bird was dumped into bottomland hardwoods. How we would prove that, I have no idea. Just uh, you know, uh, something I found interesting. Yeah. Hey, Doctor, uh, um, can I jump in for a minute? Sure, go ahead. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, I wanted to comment on that thing you said with the eDNA in the roost or the nest hole. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matt and I have been talking about that recently. We looked into a little bit. I talked to a couple experts with water DNA, and a couple people were telling me one of the problems was when you find eDNA, it's hard to tell if it's from two years ago or it's from 60 years ago. I'm not sure if you know this, but um, if you knew where that hole was and you went and got some material at the bottom of it, if the hole was shown to be only say 10 years old and there was ivory bill DNA, you could probably infer the bird was there. Yeah, maybe. We actually did go back to that hole. I remember we climbed the tree. There was some reason we didn't, we weren't very impressed by what we found in the bottom of that uh, mm. cavity when we went back. Maybe we couldn't reach the bottom. It was, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, DNA, I do a little bit of work with DNA. It's possible you get old DNA. They get DNA out of a hundred year old museum specimen. But if you're talking about a bunch of wood chips in the bottom of a nest, where it would literally be DNA from dander off the bird, single cells almost laying on that wet wood in the bottom, I don't think there's much chance there's going to be usable DNA. Uh, if you found a dried piece of feces, yeah, maybe that'd be possible. But uh, DNA is trickier than you think. It's pretty, it's pretty resilient molecule, but it does degrade. And, you know, in the southern swamps, entire pine trees go away, fall down and go away in like two years. It, the degradation of organic material is really um uh pretty swift in the in the humid uh warm swamp area so um i don't know we never felt like we had anything that i, I thought it was worth wasting my friend's time uh examining yeah it was just a thought i figured i'd mention it i have another question um have you uh considered going back and searching again or having some of your students maybe search and if so would you change your methodologies at all I have considered it. I don't know. I got into other stuff. I've actually been doing a lot more e-birding and just county listing and stuff. Um, you know, we kind of got burned out there for a while, and I just haven't. I have gone back a very few times. Yeah, the thing I would do differently is I'd have a GoPro on my head and I'd run it all the time. If uh, if we had a GoPro in 2005, we would have had at least two videos of ivory bills and maybe more. Um, so I would have I would have more than one GoPro. I'd have a GoPro. In the front of the boat, I'd have a GoPro on my head. I might do like a paddle cam, like my Collins does. I'd have GoPros all over me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'd do that. Um, otherwise, no, I wouldn't do much different. I would just just move around as quietly as I could, and hope maybe since we hadn't been in there bugging them for a while, they were back, not paying as much attention. But um, uh, no, I'd go back to the same place, and I'd do pretty much the same thing. All right, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. 
Dr. Hill, did you? So my theory of the case is I'm always looking to hear that golden first sound of the morning with the hope that that means you're within you know, a short range of the cavity. But reviewing the literature, do we know much about cavity fealty? In other words, uh, my understanding is that they, would, they might rotate among a few cavities, but they would be in relatively close proximity. Do you have an opinion on that as a search method? No, and I haven't studied this like you have, I think, like going through Tanner's notes and everything. But, um, but that's the idea. And we did it. So if you hear a double knock at dusk, you know, you figure that bird's going to – it's almost dark. It's probably going to go to bed right there. We, there was a place that's called um, – darn, I'm forgetting my landings. Anyways, up in that old creek area above our main study area. Um, and uh, twice we had a double knock in that really nice forest there uh, right at dusk. Wow. And, and we thought, you know, this is it. We got all of our searchers in there, yeah. uh, cameras on every cavity. And so either it, it never had intended to come back to there or – Every time we ran into the spot where we thought we had ivory bills, we scared them out of there. So this is a catch. It's almost like the Heisenberg uncertainty <laughs> principle. Whenever you see it, your, your movement towards it makes it retreat and become un, un, undocumentable. Yeah, that's so, great. I don't know. Um, Matthew Nahorn asks a good question. Going off the habitat discussion, there is somewhat of an overlap with ash tree range and ivory bill range. With the ash borer and the great demise of ash trees, could ivory bills be possibly transitioning slightly more into the ash tree range as it would provide incredibly more habitat and fairly quickly? I don't think they're going to leave those, those bottomland forests very much. But yeah, if there's ash trees along the edges or as part of the component of those forests and they're dead trees with beetles, I'm sure they're going to eat them. We had, we always thought ivory bills, so in the Choctahatchee area, you'll have a, you, you get a pretty ab abrupt transition from wet swamp soils to fairly dry sandy soils, just, just with a couple feet elevation change. And uh, you'll have uh, open pine woods right adjacent to the swamps. And we were pretty sure ivory bills were moving up into those forests when they became beetle infested. It, it, it's right in, you know, it's right there. It's adjacent, right adjacent to Tupelo Cypress areas and stuff. I don't, th I personally don't think they're moving tens of miles up into the pine, uh, upland pine areas. Uh, I think they're using pine areas adjacent to their wetland areas uh, in their wetland forests. Well, with that, just because I think we've, we thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I mean, we'll keep you more than two hours. No, just um, encourage everybody to get out. If you're physically able and interested, keep those GoPros running. You know, all the cavity stuff and the spark scaling, it's fun, it's interesting, but it's not convincing anybody. The only thing that's really going to move the needle is a, a very clear picture of an obvious ivory bill. Yeah. It's one GoPro image away from changing the whole story. Yeah, and cool. I would not be secretive about it. I would tell everybody right where that ivory bill was and get hand over all your evidence un, untampered and uh, hopefully it's all it's um, it becomes indisputable yeah well with that uh, thank you so much dr hill and we'll be back here again monday at 7 p.m central the same zoom stuff we're information we're trying to build a community around this uh, and then to support a search which we'll be launching soon so Thank you so much, everybody. Dr. Hill, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Great questions. And we'll see y'all next Monday. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.